The United States is generally seen as a singular thing, made evident by the fact I'm using the singular is here rather than the proper plural are. Want more evidence? In one of my old masterpiece videos, before I traded in my ignorance of existentialism for more character frames, I titled it How the U.S. States Show Their History Through Their- Look, it only matters that I wrote down U.S. States, which really just means United States States, and my comments somehow let me get away with it. I guess it makes sense why, though. The United States isn't being taken literally here. We understand that we're talking about a singular unified entity, but obviously it wasn't always like that. Looking back at older documents, you see more and more people say the United States are rather than the United States is, and there's a whole rabbit hole you can go down if you want to really look into it, but for my purposes, I want to illustrate that when the U.S. was first starting out as a country, it was really seen as an alliance or collection of independent states. More of an EU than an EEUU, if you get what I mean, and also no Spanish. Thing is, American states still had pretty fuzzy borders and subsequently plenty of border disputes to go around, the most famous of which were between two American states by the name of Pennsylvania and Connecticut, and the more astute of you will surely notice that they do not fucking border each other. Alright, so what were they fighting over? Well, it was a tiny little section in Pennsylvania starting at this latitude here and then moving north. The entire top half of the state, basically. There is a reality, not too far from our own, in which this was the modern map of the United States, and every time I see it, it triggers my flight or fight response. The conflicts that would follow would go on to be known as the Pennamite Yankee War, also simply as the Pennamite War, or also as the Glorious Repulse of the New Englander Menace. Not that I would have any biases, though, against those inbred witch-hunting savages. Right then, so how did this travesty of a claim that only a European kingdom would enforce come about? Well, a European kingdom. Back in the 1660s, when witches got what they fucking deserved, the English colony of Connecticut was given an official charter by the King of England at the time, Charles II, and along with it, it would define the borders of the new Connecticut or colony, which, barring a few border disputes, largely matched up with the way Connecticut looks today. Uh, barring the West. You see, the Europeans back then, and today for that matter, didn't quite grasp how immense the North American continent was, and since they wanted to make sure they had as many land claims as they could so they could ward off any native claims to the region or, god forbid, the French, they decided to make the western border of Connecticut run all the way to the other side of the continent. Wherever that was. Couldn't be that far. Well, about 20 years later, Charles II, who owed a significant debt to a famous war hero by the name of William Penn, was suddenly confronted by his son, also named William Penn, who was basically a 17th century hippie. Penn wanted to establish a colony out in the New World for persecuted religious sects and minorities, and Charles, willing to pay off his debt and expel these types of religious sects and minorities, willingly gave Penn a huge tract of land that would mark off largely what modern Pennsylvania would look like. But most important about this, the Pennsylvania claim happened to overlap perfectly with the claim given to Connecticut. It was the same guy who set these borders, by the way, but I mean, give the guy a break, we all get our paperwork mixed up from time to time. I mean, granted, I never started a war because of it, but uh... Wait, would this qualify as manslaughter? Well, even though the claims overlap, neither side really felt the need to enforce them quite yet, since their populations were still relatively small and nobody was settling in the area anyway. Well, I mean, until Connecticut did. The government helped fund a colonial company by the name of the Susquehanna Company, who went ahead and struck a deal with the Iroquois Confederacy to purchase a section of land in a segment of modern Pennsylvania known as the Wyoming Valley. Which, uh, fun fact, is actually where the state of Wyoming gets its name, and even more fun fact, they have roughly the same population. Uh, another fun fact, when this happened, the Pennsylvanians kind of, uh, panicked. Connecticut first sent settlers out into the valley in 1762, but that went... Um... Hello! Okay. Who are you? Oh, we just, uh, bought this land. Uh, no you didn't. Yeah, we bought some land from the Confederacy and they said, We're not Iroquois. Sorry? Yeah, the Iroquois only really claim this territory. We're not a part of them, though. We're Susquehannock, or Delaware, or... Honestly, I wasn't able to verify exactly what we were supposed to be using the sources I can get my hands on, but, uh, leave. That failed, so when Connecticut tried again a few years later in 1769, they made sure to first send up 40 armed men to the colony to secure the area and set up a fort with the absolutely sublime name of Forty Fort. Once they had the area under control, they were followed by 200 more Connecticut settlers under the command of one Captain Zebulon Butler. He was with some other guys, but I don't really care about them. However, in the time it took Connecticut to return, Pennsylvania was able to reach a deal with the Iroquois to renounce their sale to Connecticut and reaffirm some old agreement made back in the 1730s. To enforce their claim, Pennsylvania sent up a few of their own men, including a sheriff by the name of John Jennings and a captain by the name of Amos Ogden. So, now we have two states with our men occupying a disputed territory with one side moving in to arrest the other. We have war, baby, let's fucking go! The Connecticuters chased the Pennsylvanians into a small fortification and began to lay siege. The Connecticuters had about 40 armed men, while the Pennsylvanians had a mere 10. Knowing they were outgunned, Ogden offered the leaders of the Connecticuters to openly debate the justification of their claim, and almost immediately after having them enter the fort, had them arrested, showing the tactical cunning and wit of Mao Zedong. Not willing to threaten their leader, the Connecticuter militia quickly surrendered. Their leaders were promptly put in jail and even more promptly had their bail paid. The Connecticuters returned to Wyoming, the Pennsylvanians were ousted, and pretty much this whole affair was a massive practice in futility. However, so began the official start of the Pennamite Yankee War, with the Pennsylvanians representing the Pennamites and the Connecticuters representing the Yankees. And as a quick aside for any non-Americans or Neo-Confederates watching right now, the word Yankee seems to have an interesting quality to it in that it describes increasingly smaller groups of people. Depending on who's using it, the word Yankee can be used to describe an American, a Northern American, a Northeastern American, a New Englander, you get the idea. Perhaps one day I pray that the science will come far enough for us to isolate the one true Yankee and seal him off from civilized society forever. But I digress. 
Every time Ogden would take control over the valley, he was only ever able to leave a skeleton crew behind to defend it, which the Connecticuters, always ready to milk the opportunity, would break their way through this admittedly knuckleheaded defense. I mean, not to rib on their oak ale stop. Understandably kind of sick of the back and forth, the Connecticuters were quick to push for a definitive end to the conflict. So when the Connecticuters once again got Ogden under siege, the Connecticut leader at the time, Captain Zebulon Butler, resolved that neither Ogden nor the Pennsylvanians would be able to retreat to get aid again. Overnight, he pushed himself and his militia so close to the Pennamite Fort that Ogden couldn't even send a messenger to call for reinforcements, and it looked like the Pennsylvania war effort was about to die out there and then. However, thanks to Ogden's quick thinking, he was able to come up with an ingenious plan to try and sneak past him. Firstly, he tore off his clothes, and I swear there's a point to this. Secondly, he used a bit of rope to tie him around his ankle. And finally, later in the dead of night, he snuck into a nearby river, lied face upon his back so he could breathe, and let the current take him downstream. As he passed by the Connecticut siege, they saw his clothes and immediately opened fire upon them, unaware that Ogden was further along stream and completely safe. Having now passed the lines, Ogden then made a 120 mile trek to Philadelphia in just three days so he can go get help. Fucking legend. Upon hearing about their situation, the Pennsylvanians acted immediately. Panicking, they mustered up money, men, and supplies for Ogden to return to Wyoming and crush the Connecticuters in one grand final push, and thus beaming with this incredible military pride, honor, and might, they got ambushed. The consequences of this defeat in particular were so bad, in fact, that it pushed for peace to be signed between the two states. The Pens agreed to leave the valley alone, and Connecticut, who now realized they had a bunch more land to the west, creatively named it Westmoreland, showing the characteristic subtlety of New England that continues on to this day. And thus was the end of the first Pennamite Yankee War. Wait a minute, the first? Now, you might have noticed that up to this point, Pennsylvania made it a habit of continuously winning and expelling the Connecticuters from a region to only leave a handful of men behind to, in theory, defend it and in practice get overrun. Pennsylvania was, by this point, even in the 1770s, still stronger than Connecticut and didn't have to cross through New York in order to get to Wyoming, so you'd think Pennsylvania could just resolve the whole issue by flooding the valley with soldiers and settlers in one quick burst and get this whole issue resolved. Well, I mean, you'd be right, but the issue wasn't manpower or wealth, it turned out to be apathy. Worth noting that the land the Connecticuters were fighting over wasn't just Pennsylvanian territory, it was Penn territory, as in it was privately owned by the Penn family. As such, people in Pennsylvania didn't really see a reason to care about dying over a tract of land that belonged to someone else, and at least if the Connecticut had it, they'd be able to get some free land out of it. In fact, at the start of the war, Connecticut was able to do this exact thing, and was able to get over to their side 40 men from the Pennsylvania county of Lancaster, as in the only 40 men in the county of Lancaster that were not Amish. Well, a few years after the fact, a few things had changed. Firstly, the Pens had sold some of their territory to other Pennsylvanians, who now had a reason to care why a bunch of Connecticuters were living up there tainting the place up with the spugness only possible when you combine Patriots fans with graduates from Yale. Secondly, a larger number of Connecticut settlers began to pour into the region, so many in fact that they began to settle outside of the county limits. Right away, the Pennsylvania government used this as a pretext to have the settlements destroyed. For this, the Pennamites sent up a colonel by the name of Plunkett, choosing to pass up on Ogden for the fact he was kind of dead. Right away, Plunkett arrested the settlers, burned their towns to the ground, and still on that high, decided that he would be the one to take back Wyoming from the Connecticut or Scourge. He made an appeal to the Pennsylvania government, which provided him with 700 men along with some boats and artillery to break through the Connecticut or defense. This was also during the Revolutionary War, mind you. I suppose in weighing whether or not you should commit your limited manpower to a war that will get you executed for treason if you lose, compared to using them to dislodge a couple of farmers only marginally different from yourself, it should seem a bit one-sided, but then again, never forget that they were really fighting to save us from this absolute war crime of a map. And if that just so happened to require actual war crimes to accomplish, then so be it. The US Congress was actually trying to get them to stop as well, but this was before 1783, and so the US government was purely put there for decoration. And so, with nothing in the way of their reinvigorated spirit, the Pennsylvanians made their return to the Wyoming Valley. The Connecticut or settlers defending it could only muster around 300 men able to fight, and they couldn't even all be given guns. And thus, bravely, Plunkett charged the Connecticut position and utterly failed. Now, at that precise moment, things were not looking too good for Pennsylvania, nor for any future map of the US. Thankfully, just in the nick of time, an angel appeared down from the heavens, and that angel's name was the Geneva Conventions wouldn't be signed until 1864. It, it's shorter in Hebrew. Reminder that the American Revolutionary War was still very much a current event, and both Pennsylvania and Connecticut were still very in favor of the United States. Less so were members of the Iroquois Confederacy, and even less so were the British, so they decided to team up and perform a series of raids on the northern U.S. One such raid in particular was on the Wyoming Valley, where the American force was quickly overrun and the subset of all corpses that were missing their scalps began to rise dramatically. Consequently, the population of the settlement began to get a lot smaller, and would have been free for the taking for either state if it weren't for the, um, you know. Later on, however, the Revolutionary War did eventually come to an end, and the U.S. government was beginning to take being a government a bit more seriously. As such, pretty much as soon as Cornwallis had surrendered, Pennsylvania had went up to the U.S. government and asked them to arbitrate their dispute. Alright, court is now in session. Pennsylvania and Connecticut, we brought you here to resolve a... border... dispute? Uh... Pennsylvania, could you show us your claims? Uh, okay, very good. And Connecticut? What the fuck? The government had decided to take Pennsylvania's side in the dispute, and this had actual federal backing behind it, so Connecticut had to relinquish its claim. You would think by now that this would mean the war is over, but... Uh, um... 
In a rather ironic twist, the land that the Pens once sold that acted as the catalyst for the second war was now beginning to lead to a third. By this I mean the land, and ownership thereof, was now under the total legal jurisdiction of the Pennsylvanian government, who now had several new Penemites living in their borders who owned the land, as well as several old Penemites who were owed the land, so one side was probably going to end up very angry. Ultimately, the Pennsylvanian government tried to order the former Connecticuters turned Penemites, the Connecticutites, that they had to give up their land in exchange for money, to which the Connecticutites immediately said, no. Pennsylvania responded with a load of militiamen with orders to arrest the settlers. Many Canaanites, such as Zebulon Butler, were quite tired of fighting for the past 30 years and so decided to comply with the Pennsylvanians. However, some Canaanites decide to fight back, and so the Pennsylvania militia properly responded by going what most modern historians would call Vietnam on their ass. Less of a help was the fact that the Pennsylvania militia was being led by an Alexander Patterson, who had fought in all the Pennamite wars prior to this point, and he did not like Connecticuters very much if I had not been able to provide enough subtext with that Vietnam joke a few lines ago. Well, now a proper fight was going on between the Canaanite resistance and Patterson, and not willing to see things escalate further, the Pennsylvania government sent up a colonel by the name of Armstrong to take control of the situation by disarming both sides. And to this end, he was actually quite successful in doing one of these things. So Patterson and Armstrong stayed up in Wyoming, I assume enjoying their time in the Poconos, but in the meantime, their actions began to beget outcry from the rest of the country, including many other New Englander states who began to join in with Connecticut to drive out the Pennsylvanians. Including Ethan Allen, because this is around the point, I guess, where the writers began to run out of ideas and start falling back on celebrity cameos. Things got so bad, in fact, that people were beginning to fear that this would expand to the rest of the country, leading to a civil war that probably would have jeopardized the newly formed Union. In fact, one of the most drastic ideas being floated around was the idea that Wyoming become its own state by the name of Westmoreland, which, while some Connecticuters certainly endorsed the plan, others, namely Zebulon Butler, who, now that I think about it, is probably the main character of this story, just wanted integration into Pennsylvania proper. In the end, the Pennsylvania government realized how bad things were starting to get, and so they tried passing a series of compromise bills to placate the Canaanites to the best of their ability. Eventually, after years of back and forth on these compromises, the Pennsylvania government finally proposed the Compromise Act of 1799, where the Connecticuters would be given their land under the blessing of the government, and the land that the Pennamites were sold by the Penn family would be reimbursed for some equivalent amount. Finally, after 30 years of fighting, the valley was undisputedly entirely Pennsylvanian, and nobody ever thought about the region again until somebody decided to make a comedy show set there. Yes, really, I, I'm not kidding. Now, um, ultimately, while the prospect of a war between two U.S. states is generally seen as something quite funny today and easy to turn into a YouTube clickbait thumbnail, I can't help but feel this whole ordeal was really just a bit of a tragedy. I mean, the people of the Wyoming Valley didn't really care what state they belonged to and only came to the valley as a means of improving their lives, instead being met by waves of armed men coming to arrest them at best or destroy their entire homestead at worst. The fate of the valley was ultimately a situation decided by forces outside of the inhabitants' control, and it really couldn't have been that hard for such a minor dispute to remain a purely legal conflict. Really, it is a bit of a shame then that the war took until 2018 to come to an end with a score of 41-33. to 33. Get fucked, Brady! It's that